that which you are good to do for your people. Give us peace. Give us wisdom. Give us knowledge as we talk about your word. For you said in your word that those that spoke of you often, you wrote a book of remembrance for them. But we want to talk about you. Bring glory to your name. Honor to your name. And I just ask you to help Ann and I as we have this round table and those that join us, that it will be to your glory, to your praise. Amen. Amen. And even so, amen. And tonight I had put on a, I made a little blurb or a one minute video and then I made a blurb as well that said we were going to talk and we were going to do a mock talking a conversation with the Lord. I'll call him Jesus. I'm going to call him Yeshua because that's his name. But I know that if he were around me all of the time, I would be calling him Master. I'd be calling him Lord. I'd be calling him King. Uh, he, he'd probably have to give me permission to start calling him by his name. Uh, just like I call my daddy. I call him Daddy. But when I talk to somebody, I say, well, Billy don't like that. Or well, same thing with my mom. When I don't call her Faye, that's her name. Call her mom. Mm -hmm. But if I'm telling somebody something, I say, Faye Merritt, you just didn't do something, not say thank you. Or you didn't go in and not clean up your room and put your stuff up under the bed. So there's a certain amount of respect that I've been taught. And yet, when I see people today... When we talk about our master and savior, we have all kind of stuff that just we just throw out there. So uh, in this roundtable, we'll talk about many things, but I would like to, I'm going to make myself, based on the scripture, I'm going to let me be Yeshua. If, you're, Yeshua. if you don't like it, you can go look at some books that Dr. Ravi Zacharias has done one where Muhammad, uh, I think it's the prince, talked to. Jesus, he has one where Oscar Wilde talks to Jesus or Krishna talks to Jesus. Well, just regular people every day. And I believe that the Bible has enough information in it that we could talk to him through the scriptures. Truly, this is how he talks to me. When I want to do something, I can hear him. Lord knows that whenever something tears up, like for instance, I'm getting ready to try to provide a type of service. And I'm looking at the money that it will take to do it. And one of the first things I'm thinking is, I know I can do A, B, and C. But what if D happens? I know based on the scripture that we've been talking about in our round table, God's laws for his people, which we have not, we're not going to jettison. But there's a reason that we bring in Jesus in on this. And I'll tell you what that is in a minute. I know that I'm going to be responsible. Even if the person couldn't legally sue me, I know what God's standard is. So before I do any investing and doing something like that, I want to make sure I can cover what needs to be covered. So with that, let if you will, and tell me that one thing that the individual was arguing with this guy named Ron about, it was a preacher. Uh, let me, can you do the setup for me? Because I'll mess it up. So basically the, the debate, um, was really centered around um, the Israelites and what part do they play in the New Testament and does it even matter about them anymore? Hey, this is a look. So, <laughs> so anyway, so the pastor um, was saying that um, he wanted to know, well, what did, you know, what did Jesus say? About you know about Israel, what what you know he. Hey, this is a little this short thing is, um, to say that I'm, I'm and something is messing things. up, and what's going on is I did that. I'll okay. stop. I'll do something. It, it's it's a glitch. But go ahead. The, oh, the so, past was saying anyway, what? So Ron was saying they do play a part. Who were all the people in Acts chapter two? They were all of Israel. So. He said, oh, but what did Jesus say? And he showed him what Jesus said about sending them out to um, the lost sheep. The lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay. 
So he said, no, 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 that doesn't matter. And he said, what do you mean that doesn't matter? He said, well, he hadn't died yet. So he said, so are you telling me that nothing he said mattered before he died, only what he said after? And he said, well, you have to get, you have to get an understanding of, of what that is, but that doesn't matter. It's just after he rose from the dead, those things, you know, matter. And, you know, you have to learn, you know, what what applies and what don't apply. But that particular scripture that he showed him, he said it didn't matter because he hadn't died. Since Gary is on the line, Gary, have you ever heard any such thing like that, that whatever Jesus said before he died doesn't matter? It doesn't matter to the believer because this is the way I heard it. That is Old Testament. And since it's Old Testament, it has no bearing on us today. Have you heard such before? When you say Old Testament, do you mean Old Covenant? Old Covenant. Okay. I'm not seeing this live on the thing. Um, what's going on? I don't know. Is it, is it on live? It's, it's showing it. I'm on it now. It's not showing it on mine, but anyway. I'll go with that. Okay, but here is the thing that I'm looking at, if that's true, that nothing that he said matters before he died, then what is really, what, why is he here? What is the point? I've heard people say that everything that Jesus said before he died is under the law. Everything that he said is under the law, it doesn't matter, yet the same people when it comes to saying that we're going to enforce the tithes, they'll go to something that Jesus had said before he died, and they'll enforce it. And in doing that, it's, it shows to me that a person is arbitrary, they're not consistent. And so I'd like to just have an idea as we do our discussion tonight, is there any other person that has had heard that kind of thing? But if I were to say to our Lord and Savior, Yeshua, they say that everything you said doesn't matter before you died, and only that which you have said after you died, where you say, go and preach the gospel. That's the only thing that matters. What do you say? Well, first of all, I said I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. Now, I said that. Before I died, are you really willing to tell me that I'm no longer the way, that I'm no longer the truth, that I'm no longer the life? Are you willing to tell me that now, that when I said before, that if a man keeps my commandments, he'll abide in my love, even as I've kept my father's commandment and abide in his love? Are you willing to tell me that I have no right to say that anymore? Are you telling me that that's not bound anymore? Or is it what you're really saying is that you don't have to obey me anymore? Are you saying that you don't have to obey me as king? Are you really saying that you don't have to obey me as Lord? Are you really saying that everything that I said, when I said don't do your alms before men to be seen of men, you'll have your reward? When I tell you that you judge, but you judge according to righteous judgment, are you saying that I came and I lived and I taught only to die? And after that, grace is not what I taught. What I taught is that if you obey me and if you abide in me, then you will be able to have my father's love. Just like I kept my father's love by abiding in him. The real truth of the matter is you don't want to keep my commandments. When you don't want to keep my commandments, you'll make up your own. And is that what you found to be the issue? That people never take into consideration what they're saying to the Lord? What are you getting ready to say? They, they think that is what I find they're not really saying. It's, it's funny. Okay. Um, Maybe we started or something. I, I can do that. But the, but the thing is, is that I have seen 
that when an individual does that, they don't really seem to care about what he really has said. They're more interested in what they think. And so I cannot imagine talking to my Lord. For instance, I was reading on the thing today. It was the day or yesterday. And the man said, only the Father can judge me. Mm-hmm. Have you ever heard anything like that before? Well, you know, I've heard only God can judge me. Okay. So, and I'm assuming that that's what they mean. I mean, Tupac said it. I've heard, you know, people who, lawless people, usually, it's, you dare say, do they need to call back in? I didn't know it disconnected. If it did, I, he would, he would, I, I don't see where it disconnected. I'll just go back and put it back in anyway, because it seems as if sometimes when we do stuff, as if there's a possibility that we're having issues with Facebook. I don't know if that's the case, but you know, you can blame stuff on them and it doesn't necessarily mean it's them. So I just call back in that way if anybody else decide they want to join in as well. Gary, are you able to hear us now? We can. Okay, did we lose you? Yes, I mean, we didn't hear anything. Mama and I was talking. We didn't know if y'all could hear us. I was I had suggested that we both hang up and call back in. Well, you weren't really showing up on the conference line, but you're there now. And now what I'm getting ready to have, and to just, let me just ask you, have you ever heard anybody say only God the Father can judge me? Um, no. Or something similar? Okay. Well, when I'm out, that's what well, I hear. With, with me, not, okay. It, it generally, in that people can't, because um, we were talking, I mentioned the Trinity before, that was the well thing, but with regard to no one person on the, on the earth really could, yes. Okay. And how would you address that question? Would you phrase it in a question that you would ask the Lord about that judging when people say that, that only God can do me? Or like the one I read where it says only the Father can judge me. I would me. just ask, is that true? Is that a true statement? <laughs> I mean, is it true that no one can judge a person but God, would they say? And I know, I'm sure that they mean just the Father. And this is what I would say. You mean to tell me that you're saying only the Father could judge me? That's not what I taught. What I taught is this, that the Father judges no man. He has committed all judgment unto me. I told you that. You could listen to my Apostle John say that. If you were to go to John chapter 5, you will hear him tell the people exactly what I said because the only person that's going to ever judge you is me. Look at John chapter 5. And then 21. I want you to see that. I want you, I want you to see the power that he's given to me. Read it, please, Andrina. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Now read the next verse. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. So you see, the Father judges nobody. So when you say the only person that can judge you is the father, you're you're saying either I'm a liar or it's going to mean that you're a liar. And I'm telling you now, I'm truth. I never lie. The father judges no man. He has committed all judgment unto the son. And guess what I do with that judgment? I commit my judgment to other people. And the apostle Paul, whom I selected, He took that and he told the people in Corinth that I gave them power to judge. If you will, young sister, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. I'll show you that I've committed judgment. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, the apostle Paul shows that I gave the ability to judge to the people that you all call the church. You call it the church, but I call it my called out people. I call it my people that are in covenant with me. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says based upon what I taught. Dare any of you having matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? The world, the word, the word there is cosmos. Can he not be any clearer? And if the world be judged by you, are you not worthy to judge the smallest matters? 
But you have people walking around saying, only my father can judge you. I'm the judge. Not only did I commit judgment to my people, I commit judgment to those that are my called out. And you all don't take advantage of that. What do you mean? when? What do I mean when I say you all don't take advantage of that? Go to in your Bibles, the Bible that you all have. Go to Matthew chapter 18. I'm going to show you that I gave you power to judge. I'm going to show you that it's not just the Father. Go look at your Bibles in what is called Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. I'm going to let you hear what I said. Not only am I going to let you hear what I said, I'm going to tell you that those of you that think that my words mean nothing until I died and was raised again, you're going to come into a great awakening one day. Mm. And I'm going to say that part from me, I never knew you. You were iniquity and lawlessness. Mm. Now look at the 15th verse there. It says, moreover, if your brother trespass against you, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, you have gained your brother. Did you hear what I taught? Mm. He recorded it correctly. But then I told the people, I told my apostles, if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more. And in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. But you may not understand that. You may not understand that we're talking about judging because many of you, you don't read the scriptures that testify of me. See, all those scriptures testify of me. If you don't understand that, you can look in your Bibles, John chapter 5, verse 39. I told them, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they that testify of me but you won't come to me. But if you go back and look in the scriptures, the one that I gave Moses, when I told them how to judge, when I set up judging for the people, if you look at that 19th chapter of that book that you all call Deuteronomy, look at the 15th verse. It's going to show you something about court. It says, one witness shall not rise up against a man or any iniquity or, or lawlessness, I want. And it says, or sin, in any sin that he sinneth, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses shall every matter be established. What verse is that? That's Deuteronomy chapter 19 in your Bible in the 15th verse. Okay. See, I didn't need a Bible because I am the living word. I gave Moses those words. And Moses, when they codified them, he wrote them down. In subsequent years, they gave you all chapter and verse so you could find it because I just say Moses said. Now, it says in the next verse, if a false witness rise up against any to testify to you in court, to testify against him anything that is wrong, then both of the men whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days. Listen, then, or uh, and the judge shall make diligent inquisition. Behold, if the witness be a false witness and have testified falsely against his brother, then you shall do unto him as he is thought to have done unto his brother. So shall you put evil away from among you. Now, my question, because I'm good at questions as well. How is it then Moses can judge? Moses can set 70 men and give them the ability to judge. Moses can even give you the instruction of how to judge with two or three witnesses. And yet I can't. You're going to say only the father can. That, that wasn't even back before Moses came. Moses came under what you all will eventually say is the Aaronic law. But in actuality, Moses got my law before Aaron ever got his uh, position. Aaron got his position in what you all call Exodus 28. But it's called the Aaronic law. 
It was never to be the total of, of the law. It was always to train you, but the law was really going to come through me when I came on earth. Your prophet Joseph, not Joseph, but Jacob said it. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver, till Shiloh come. So to get back to the place. Moses judged, the 70 elders judged, I judge, and if you go back, I'm going to have to mute somebody. And then we go back to what we would call your New Testament in Matthew chapter 18. And it says, but if he will not hear thee, I'm in Matthew 18 and 16. If he will not hear thee, take with thee one or two, that in the mouth of every witness, let me do this. I have to go back. I have to move from being Jesus to go and do the mute thing. Now, now I'm perfect. Now we can go back to that. Because what happens is some phones don't mute well. It says, but if take two or three, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. This is what I have told you to judge each other in your assembly. And some people won't stand for that. They will leave an assembly. If you have a judgment, they will leave. They will say, you can't judge. Only God can judge me. This is his judgment. This is his judgment. Listen, my daughter, do you remember when the flood was over? I gave them in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, that if a man kills a man, or if an animal kills a man, by man's brother shall he be put to death, for he is in the image of God? I set up judgment among people. But it's always going to be by my word. And since the Father judges no man, and has committed all judgment to the Son, the Son has given it to his people that follow him. And in verse 18 of 18, it says, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound on heaven, and whatsoever be loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I say again, that if two of you agree on anything, touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done to them of my Father which is in heaven. What is it that you're asking for? Righteous judgment. So, uh, are you comfortable? Because it really doesn't matter if you're comfortable with my answer. Are you clear with my answer that it's not the Father that's judging? It's me and the people that I set to judge. Now, Gary had an amazing question that he was saying. Gary, what was that question that you were saying that you would ask, if you if you would talk to the Lord Jesus, you would ask? Uh, it was something about Trinity, yes. Explain it. I don't know. Maybe it was explain it. I, I'm going to let him. I'm going to have him to speak. Go ahead, Garrett. What What were you saying? I was asking if you could hear me, but um, you were talking about the judging. Suppose someone asked you about the 13th and the 25th chapter of John, chapter eight. Let's Let's look at it. John 13 and eight. Because I I think. Uh, someone would ask that in the verse the verse reads in um, John 8 and if I if I start bumbling around then you all can read it um, John 8 so you're not 13 and 13 and 8 Peter says thou shalt never wash my feet so you mean 8 and 13 I mean 8 and 15 okay so give a little bit of context I'll start at 13 8 and 13 the Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know for I know whence I came and whither I go. For ye cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. 15. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. So I think this really goes with Deuteronomy, but just for the sake of the discussion. And there's more text. And then it goes on to the 25th verse, and I, so you might want to cover some of this in between. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning, I have many things to say and to judge of you. But he that sent me is true, and I speak uh, to the world those things which I have heard of him. So the one asked you, 
Well, Jesus said, I don't, I, I, I don't judge anyone what would you say to those people. That's a that's a very good question. I'm glad I'm glad you brought it up because it would seem as if there's a contradiction, wouldn't it, Andrina? You have anything to say before I go into it? Okay. So the the light of this the light of this comes when he has gone on and he's been talking to these people and they have shown themselves to be wicked as as they normally do. And so the, the Pharisees, they brought this woman that's supposed to have been caught in adultery. They brought this woman to her insofar as they're saying they're doing Moses' law and they're keeping Moses' law. They're not keeping Moses' law. They didn't bring the man and the woman. They just brought the woman. So automatically, they were false witnesses. Then when they did that, they wanted to know, uh, when he asked, him, he asked them, where are your accusers? And people think Jesus forgave the woman. He didn't forgive the woman. They didn't have a case against her. And so then we come down where he didn't condemn the, the didn't condemn the woman. So when we get to the place where the Pharisees, you bear record of yourself. Your record is not true. What was the record that he bore? He says, I'm the light of the world. He that follows in me shall not walk in darkness but have light, the light of life. So when they make that statement, they're making that statement incorrectly. When they say you bear record of yourself, your record is not true, you don't have two or three witnesses to prove what you're saying, he says, first of all, that's not the only record that I'm giving you. The record that you need to look at is your Torah mm -hmm. in your law. It's, look at what he says in verse 17. Now, I'm telling you, in your law, the testimony of two men is true. Number one, I am a man. Mm -hmm. I'm God, but I'm a man. I have not exercised my power as God as I could. I bear witness of myself that the Father has sent me. And look at this. The Father that sent me, he bears witness. That's two. Notice, I am. I am one that bear witness of myself. You can say the one is in italics all day long, but it says, I am bear witness of myself. Then it says, and, or Kai, and the father that sent me bear witness of me. Then they said, where's your father? I said, you don't know me. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. If you had known me, you would have known that spirit that's resident in me. You would have known him. And they said he spoke these words in the treasury. And they wanted to kill him. The point that's being made here is that in their law, you would have Moses bearing witness of him. You would have Elisha. You would have Elijah. And some people don't understand typology. So let's just say the Psalms, the writings. And the prophets, Isaiah said that, that he would have the servant to come. He would bear the sins of the people. You have the Psalms talking about, you will not leave my soul in hell. You will not allow your Holy One to suffer corruption. You have Psalm 45 saying, talking about the Father says, your throne, O God, is forever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have David calling to me and saying that I said to him, sit on my right hand, or it said that you know, my Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So he says the law, that's more than one, that's Torah. I bear witness of me. Father bear witness of me. And if you go to John chapter 5, you're really going to get to see it. These are the beautiful passages. Go back to John chapter 5 and then you'll see something else because they had that same kind of issue in John where the individuals were having problems with him bearing witnesses of himself or bearing witness of himself. He says, Moses, whom you speak or you talk about. Let me go to verse 39, okay? 5 and 39. He's talking to people that by the time you get to chapter 8, he says he bears witness of himself. He says, search the scripture. They are they that testify of me. You will not come to me that you will not that you will have life. The scriptures, that's more than one witness. Witness 
written testimony is valid in the court of God's law. If it's not, why did he write his on the tables of stone? That was witness against his people. It was either witness for you or against you of the covenant, and it was sprinkled with blood. And it says, you will not come to me. I don't receive my honor from man, but I know you. You don't have the love of God in you. I come in my father's name. You don't receive me. If another come in his own, you'll, you'll accept him. But do you not think that I will accuse you to my daddy, who I say bear witness of me? And then he says, even Moses. He said, there is one Moses whom you trust, verse 45. Or if you had believed Moses, you would have believed in me. For he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how will you believe my words? So my answer to you, young brother, is this. It's really simple. I was telling them, and they were saying that I bear witness of myself. My scriptures never said that you can't bear witness of yourself. It's just that one witness by itself would not be accepted. And I showed that I had more than one point of validation. I have the Father. I have the Scripture. I have Moses. I have the prophets. And I wouldn't even allow the demons to give reference. But many of them spoke of who I was. They trembled. They were very much afraid. So that would, that's how I would handle that one, Gary. Thank you. I like that. I like the fact that you brought it up because what ends up happening is people will dig into the scripture and find some point where they think they can find a little piece of, of mess. And then when they take that and they say, this is how you can determine that the Bible is not really the word of God. Now you were asking something on the Trinity earlier that, you, and I'd, I'd like you to phrase that in your own word, not, not mine. And we don't have to use the word Trinity. We can talk about the triunity of, of the Messiah, but go ahead. So the question is, um, speaking to Christ, how will you just, how would you explain yourself to, to, to the masses, your relationship to, to the Father as being a part of the triune uh, being or essence of God? How, how will you explain that? Well, the way that I explained it before, it was really it was really something that they should have taken into heed uh, in heed, but they didn't. And one time they tried to kill me for it. But this is what I told them in your Bible in John chapter eight, verse thirty six. I told them in John eight thirty six, if the Son will make you free, you'll be free indeed. I didn't say if the Father make you free, you'd be free indeed. I said if I did it. And then he says, when I tell you this, I know you are Abraham's seed. You are truly the descendants of Abraham. You are Hebrew people, but you seek to kill me. My word has no place in you. The way that I want you to see that I was showing them that I proceeded from the Father and that I'm not the Father Listen to what I gave him as a qualifier for my word. Listen to this verse here in 38. I speak that which I have seen with my father. And you do that which you have seen with your father. My qualification is, is I'm telling them that what I'm doing and what I've seen and what I speak is coming from my father not from me. You would have to make me be a liar or make me be delusional or make me have guile found in my mouth. I said, I'm using it as a comparison. You see something of your father. The only way that this could be equal that I am my father is that they are Satan. Listen to the comparison. I speak that which I've seen with my father. I and my father, I'm showing you that they're separate. You do that which you have seen with your father. So if I do that which I've seen with my father and I am my father, then you do what you've seen with your father, then you would thus have to be the devil or Satan. 
Well, they answered me and they said, you know, uh, Abraham is our father. And I told them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. I knew Abraham. Abraham ate with me. Abraham ate. If you look in your Bible, Abraham ate with me in what you all call Genesis 18. He actually... I say he ate with me. He probably ate afterwards because you have no record of him eating with me, but you know he prepared me a, a wonderful meal. Prepared also the messengers with me a meal. He's testifying to that right there, that he was there. Yes, he is. As you would think, when did he have opportunity? He's saying it as if Abraham had opportunity to kill him. <laughs> Thank you. Or at least try. Right. Like, he, he, Abraham didn't do this when he met me. That's right. And, you, and you're missing the point. And that's what people are missing the point. He's saying this. Then he says, he was just quite amazing. But now you seek to kill me, a man. Notice he says he's a man. Now, in your Bible, Numbers 23 and 19 said, God is not a man that he should lie. Now, you can say that's saying that he's not a man that he should lie, not saying that he's a man. But listen, God is not man. The Bible said God is spirit. There became a time in humanity where God took on humanity. And it says, a man that have told you the truth, which I have heard from God, this not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. And they say, we be not born of fornication. They were trying to tell me that I was born a bastard. He said, but we have one father, even God. And I told them, if God were your father, and you're lying. You are a bastard. You are illegitimate. God is not your father. You're claiming a father that's not yours. It's illegal. It's illegitimate. You are the bastard. Okay? You are born of fornication. Because I remember when I adopted you back in Genesis, uh, Gen not Genesis, Exodus 4 and 22, and I told Pharaoh, let you all go because you're my firstborn. If not, I'll kill your firstborn. So how is it that you get another father? Because you all have moved your allegiance to be under the head of your father, Satan, which is spiritual. You've given up your sonship. You've allowed yourself to be dead to me and alive to Satan. And he says, he says, they say, you're not born, we're not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. If God were your father, you would love me. I proceeded and came forth from God. I'm the man that proceeded to come forth of God. Listen to this. I tried to tell him I didn't come of my own self. John 8, 42. I didn't come of myself. He sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Why do you all not understand my speech? Because you can't hear my word. Then, 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 listen to what, what I've told him in John 47. He that is of God, hear, heareth God's word. You don't hear them because you're not of God. And so, with that, Gary, that's one of the ways that I would show. There's a multiplicity of other ways. I would say, in being Jesus, who did I commend my spirit to? I commended my spirit to someone. I was crying. Your book of Hebrews say I was with strong crying and tears to somebody that could save me. And I said, Father, I didn't say, me, me if it's possible, me if it's possible, remove this cup. Nevertheless, not my will, but my will be done. I said, Father, if it be possible, remove this cup, but not my will, but thine be done. And that shows that there's a great difference between the Father and the Son. One other place that I would just come and show you, Gary, as myself, 
if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that's quite an amazing passage there. And I don't think most people ever pay that much attention to it because the way it's written in the King James Version is kind of, it's kind of funny. Uh, funny in the, what I mean, strange sense. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 25, Tim, you, you might ought to read verse 23, but we really want to get to 27. In verse 23, Paul says to every man he comes out to his own order. And if you want to know the context of that, he's saying that Christ is the first fruits in verse 20 of them that slept. That's how we know what kind of body we're going to have after we are raised from the dead because of the type of body that Christ had. And it says, for since by man came death, by man came the resurrection of the dead. Or as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. The comparison is being made of what Adam is to the world and what the Christ is to the world. And so it says, every man after his own order, Christ in the first fruit will be in that order. After was dated of Christ in his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom. Notice, then cometh the end when he, talking about Christ, will have delivered up the kingdom to God, to even the Father, when he will have delivered the that's what we got to look at. He's going to deliver. Like I got this book. He delivered the kingdom to God the Father. And when he had put down all rule and authority and power, for he must reign, Christ must reign, till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is a death. Now listen to verse 27 closely. For he has put all things under his feet when he has said, all things are put under him. It is manifested that he is accepted. He accepted. That means not included. He is accepted, which did put all things under him. God the Father is accepted. God is not under the Son. And so it says, and then, and when all things shall be uh, subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him that God may be all in all. The point being made is that Christ is going to rule and that his rulership will eventually have an end. He's going to deliver everything in the kingdom back to the Father. Gary, does that help a little bit at all? Yes, it does. That's very good. Um, I, I like it when you when you show the interaction of being subservient to to um, the father. So yeah, that's that's good. Is there is there anything is there anything else you'd like to come out with? Uh, at, uh, I think you could speak perhaps to the uh, to the side of the Holy Spirit, and since we're since we're talking about the. Uh, the Trinity and that that relationship, um, as it is often put together, some people believe that the scriptures that the Trinity at all while others do. So, um, what would you say with regards to the Holy Spirit in relationship to to the Messiah? That that's a, I'm glad that you brought that up because I I thought about it. And I just didn't say anything. And then after you brought it up, I said, I, I really do need to deal with it. Let me give you this last part that I did, uh, that I mentioned earlier. I want to give that address of that. If you look at Hebrews 5 and 7, this is the address of where I was talking about before, where it says, um, if I look at 6, let's look at 5, because I like, I like 5 because, Five shows that he's begotten, and this is the Father talking. Uh, listen to what it says in verse 5, Hebrews 5 and 5. So Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest. He did not make himself a high priest. If Christ did not make himself a high priest, then he can never be high priest. Understand that if what they're saying is true, if Christ is God the Father, he could never be a high priest. If he's God the Father, he didn't make himself a high priest. Who did? Was that clear? Because I don't know if that's clear. That makes sense. I think there's uh, nobody else that could do it. it. Huh? I think that makes sense. Okay, so he says, 
So Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said to him, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. The one that begat him is the one that made him a high priest is what this passage is saying. And it says, as he says in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now it comes down into the days of his flesh, who in the days of his flesh, this high priest, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. Who can save the Christ from death if he is God Almighty and the Father himself? Whoever that would be would need to be now called God and the Father if it's another person. And so he says he's offered up strong crying and tears with supplication to him that was able to save him from death in that he was heard in that he feared listen to this though he were a son yet learned the obedience through the things which he had suffered as high priest as made high priest by the father so that he could offer himself a ransom and then it says and being made perfect he became the author of eternal salvation to those that obey him. If he doesn't have a father, he would have always been the author of eternal salvation. But because of the fact he took this role and took it through humanity, according to the second chapter of Hebrews, he was able to become the author of eternal salvation to those that obey him. Now we go back into the part where we're looking at the Trinity. And did you have anything to say, precious love? Okay. Let's look at Luke chapter 3. One of the amazing things is, is that the Bible is replete in giving information in more than one spot so that we can actually look at it. And when we look at it that way, we're able to, I would say, take information, look at things that look like they would be uh, contradictions and say, no, they're not contradictions. It's just taking a different aspect so that we can see it. Let's go to the 21st verse of Luke. You see, now it says, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass also that Jesus was being baptized. So he comes to John. And in some places, John said, I'm not worthy. To, I'm not worthy. I could probably go to Matthew. I ought to go there. I got the time. Let me go to Matthew 3. And in Matthew 3, we're going to have the same thing. So John is preaching in the wilderness, and he's telling the people to get ready. And he's already told them, God is ready to destroy you all. The axe is already laid to the root of these Hebrews. It's laid to the root of the trees. It's already ready to tear you in sunder. And so in the 15th verse, so you have Matthew 3 and 15. You have Luke 3 and 20. Matthew 3, 15. Luke 3 and 20. In Matthew it says in Jesus, well, I may mean, we'll go 13 and 13. Jesus come to Galilee from Jordan. I'm in Matthew to be baptized of John, and John forbade him. John said, no, 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 master, I can't, but I can't baptize you. Dude, you got to suffer it to be so for now. John, you got to do it. I'm the one that's being sent. I'm the one that has already lit, had it lit, me known to you that I'm coming. You got to do it. And so suffer it. Allow it to be so for now. Allow this out of the ordinary. But yes, I am greater than you. Yes, I do have a greater position than you because of who I am, because of my role. But just allow it to be so for now. And, and when he suffered me, when he allowed me, and I was baptized, and I, when I went out of the water, the heavens opened. And then the Holy Spirit descended like a dove set on me. 
I didn't leave my body in an astral projection and go up to heaven and do like the karmic will or the Buddhist will or the reincarnational will and come back down and get on top of the shell of my body as a dove. The Spirit of God came and lit on me like a dove. And then from heaven, my father spoke, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. But Luke, after he gives a recording of what had happened, Luke will tell it this way. And it says all the people were baptized. It came to pass that Jesus being baptized and praying. More than likely like this, not like this, praying because they would raise their hands praying. And the Holy Ghost or the Hagias Numa or the, the Ruch HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, it descended in a bodily shape and it got on me. And the voice came from heaven and told me, I am his beloved son. And he was well pleased with me. But that wasn't the end of it. Then the Spirit led me up into the wilderness. I didn't lead myself. The Father is not leading me. The Spirit leads me up the, into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Because I need you all to understand the same Spirit that's going to lead me and be with me and empower me to do his will is the same one you all going to have to depend on. And so I went through what is called my temptation. But my apostle John, he tells you how the Holy Spirit works with me. Now you'll have to go to John 3. Seems like a coincidence on all of these threes. It, it, it should make it easy for you to, to understand and be able to listen to it and pull the juice out of it. So if you look at John chapter 3 and look at verse number 30, John says he must increase. I must decrease. He's better than me. I wasn't able to tie his shoe latchets, but he said do it for now. It's the righteous thing to do. I'm humbling myself. You know that that's not what I have to do. But I'm doing it to please the Father. I'm doing it to be a kinsman redeemer. I'm doing it to avenge my brother Adam and all those that came from him. I'm going to defeat the devil. I am the avenger of blood. Verse 31 says, He that cometh from above is above all. He that is from the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. John understood me. He understood that I'm from heaven. He understood that I'm above all. And he says, in what he has seen and heard that he testified. What he has seen, I understand that this is the God man. I understand he's not the father. John says, and what I have seen and heard that I testify. And no man received my testimony. And that I have received the testimony that God has set to my seal that God is true. John, and, and then he says, listen, for he whom God has sent, he's talking about me. He speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. I was given the spirit in measure above other men. But I told my disciples about the spirit. And I wanted them to know. That when I was on the earth, I taught. I stood for righteousness. I stood for that which was. But I told them that I got to go. In your Bibles in John chapter 16, if you look at the fifth verse. He says, I go my way. I go my way to him that sent me. I don't go to myself. I go to him that sent me. 
And none of you ask where I go. But because I say these things, sorrow has filled your heart. You're over there looking sad. Sorrow has filled your heart. But I'm telling you the truth. It's expedient that I go. It's expedient. I, I need to ascend to the Father. I need to go to the Father. I need to fulfill that what Daniel says, where I am carried up in the clouds and I go to the Ancient of Days, my Father. I'm going to receive a kingdom. I'm going to receive dominion. I'm going to receive power over all languages and all tongues and they all are going to have to obey me and eventually I'm going to turn Turn the kingdom over to you all that you can have the same kind of thing. But if you're not familiar with that, you may have to go back and eventually look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 through 18, and you'll see it. But he says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. I got to go away. Or if I go not away, the comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. He's not me. I go, I send him. I was sent, now I'm going to send. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin. He's not going to make you roll over and show your panties. He's not going to make you roll over and look like you've been with Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh rolling and foaming at the mouth. He's not going to make you babble incoherently where no one will understand what you say and that you can lay your hand on somebody when you don't know how to give answers and say, bubble oh bubble oh yabba dabba do. He's going to reprove the world. He's a person. He's going to convict the world of sin. He's going to reprove the world of righteousness. He's going to set that righteous standard and he's going to reprove the world of judgment. Because the world doesn't seemingly understand or walk with me. They sin. They don't do righteous judgment. And these things got to take place of righteousness because I go to the Father. If I don't go to the Father, he won't reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He's doing it because I go to the Father. I was doing it while I was here. Of judgment because the prince of the world is judged. I win. I win. I destroy him through death because I'm put to death as a false witness. And therefore, by a false witness, false allegation, the Father raises me from the dead. And the prince of the world is judged. They say, I've sinned because they believe not on me. He's going to reprove the world because they decide they want to stay in wickedness. Because he that believes not in your Bible, John 3 and 18, is condemned already. Because he has not believed. So the Holy Spirit is doing that. Now, but when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. I'm not going to be right there with you on the ground. Yes, I can come in spirit, but I'm sending him to guide you into all truth. He will not speak of himself. I didn't come and speak of myself. He will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, he can hear. He's a person. He will speak. He will show you things to come, and he will glorify me, the very thing that you should do. Therefore, he will teach you how to glorify me and bring honor to me, and then when you honor me, you honor the Father because he has sent me, and he will show it to you. But I have even more to tell you that the Holy Spirit is not me. Move down to your 26th verse of your John 16. And at that day, you shall ask in my name. And I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself, third person, 
It's not me I'm talking about. The Father himself loveth you because you love me. And believe that I came out from God. I came from the Father. Do you know how, more, how hard that was? Do you know how low I had to bring myself? I came from the Father to be here for you. But I didn't come here to be your doormat. I came here to reconcile you to the Father. But I rule. I'm not a joke. I came from the Father. The Father loved me and believed that I came from God. I came from the Father. Listen, I came forth from the Father and am coming to the world again. I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples, the disciples say, now you speak plainly and in no proverb. When Paul grabs a hold of this, Paul lets you know that it took place Paul lets you know that these things really happen. If you look at Romans chapter 8, verse 26, you get a chance to see that these things took place. Paul says, when he's talking to the people, that he says in 8 and 26, he says, likewise the spirit, the pneuma, the rock, the wind, the spirit of God helps our infirmities. We don't know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit, the Spirit Himself, I know it says itself, the context is Himself, the, when He got what they call a neuter. So the Spirit itself make intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. You cannot, this is not a prayer language. Tim, you said, listen, the Spirit itself, you are not the Spirit. It makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot, it cannot be uttered. You don't get to utter it. It's indescribable. And he that searches the heart, search, he knoweth the mind of the spirit because he makes intercession for the saints by the will of God. And then that same spirit that was sent that to reprove the world of sin Righteousness and judgment. When Ananias, they did sin. They were unrighteous. And the judgment fell on them when they lied in Acts chapter 5. And Peter identified the Holy Spirit in a way that I'm pretty sure a lot of people wish were never written in the scriptures. Acts 5, 1, it says, I don't even want to go there. It's just verse 3. Peter said to Ananias after he lied, Acting like he sold his house and he's going to lay the money down like it's a tithe. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the person, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, and to keep back part of the land while it remained? Wasn't it yours, dude? It was yours, brother. It was yours, brother. You could have kept all the money, Brother, you know, sometimes black folks say, bruh, it was yours. Why has Satan, why have you conceived this thing in your heart? Verse 4, you have not lied unto men, but unto God. He identifies the Holy Spirit as God. He didn't identify him as the Father. He didn't identify him as Jesus. I'm pretty sure Peter would have known who we call Jesus and Yeshua. He said, you lied to God. Yeah, I don't know how that helped you any, but it was good for me to go through it for myself. That was good. I like the way um, particularly you showed with him being led by the Spirit and in the Ananias and so forth. It was good too, so I, I, I think it was good. So thank you. Andrea, do you have anything you can that you can add Cause this will be in a Tim, not even one inch. It's Tim and Gary. Well, you know, I I, I love I, I love having my brother to help me out. I have a question for Jesus. Okay. Huh? Okay. So I hear um, people who are proponents of transgender and homosexuality say. 
that you never said anything against either one of those things. So you pretty much either you approve of it because you know you you love everybody and you love everything about them. You may you may not like their deeds, but you love them. Or <clears throat> or that's that's one of the things. Or they say, well. You know, since he said nothing, then he's pretty neutral on the subject of homosexuality and transgender. So, what what did, what what you say to that? They do error because they don't know the scripture nor the power of God. You see, the heat that made them in the beginning made them male and female you'll find it in your bible in the 19th chapter of what you call matthew and i had a question similar to that come to me in the third verse it was about some people that were the hasid and, and you called them the pharisees repeat your address please matthew chapter 19 verse 3 and the Pharisees came and they were trying to tempt me and they were saying is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause well we're not talking about wife here but if we're talking transgender and we're talking homosexuality then we're going to be talking about um, same sex marriage we're going to be talking about things of that sort so in order to deal with that, let's go back to how I answered before. He didn't made them from the beginning. And he says, is it lawful? That's what they ask. To put away the wife for every cause. And, and I ask, have you never read? Have you not read? He that made them from the beginning made them male and female. Now, I didn't tell them that it was me that made them. That would have been too much for them to understand. But for you to understand that you can know the mysteries of the kingdom, I want you to understand that I made them. And in your Bible in John chapter 1, verse number 2, you will see that I'm the one that made them. But I can speak of myself in the third person. Often I would just say, the son of man this, the son of man that. Well, if I start at verse 1 in John 1, it says, in the beginning was the word that that's me and the word was with god i was with my father and the spirit and the word that was me was god i was in the beginning with god and all things were made by me the word and without me was not anything made that was made in me was life and the life was the light of men and that light that's in me, that possessed me, that I'm possessed with, it shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot comprehend it. But if I bring you on down, I want you to understand in verse 10, I was in the world, and the world was made by me, and the world don't know me. I came to my own Hebrew people. I came to my own Hebrew people, and they didn't receive me. But as many as receive me, I give them power to become the sons of God. So when I say that in the beginning, he that made them, made them male and female, back in what you all call Matthew 19 and 4, and it says, for this cause, he made them male and female. He made them male and female. What I'm trying to tell you is that when I made them, I gave them distinction. I gave them distinction for male. I gave them distinction for female. I call one ish. I call one isha. I call one. The, I gave one the seed. I gave one the egg. I call one fathers. I call one mothers. I know the difference between between them and therefore when you start asking about transgender and homosexuality I gave men what was upright 
I gave man what was true, but man sought out many inventions and innovations. Solomon wrote about that in, in Ecclesiastes 8 and 11. But when people say that I didn't say anything about homosexuality, it's because they don't understand that when I speak, that I spoke all to what they call the Old Testament. They think that I just now started to speak. But I need them to understand if they go to their Bible in Matthew chapter 11, I will show you that I knew about the way that people live. I knew the kind of wickedness that people did. And so what I will do is I will show you by a certain word that you all have in your Bible. I'm going to show you, what, what, I'm going to use John the Baptist, because a lot of times people, they don't really understand John the Baptist, but I say he's a great preacher. Now, listen to what goes on in verse 7 of Matthew chapter 11. I was talking to people and I asked them, uh, concerning John, why did you go out in the wilderness? What did you go out there to see? Did you go out there to see a, a reed flopping in the wind? What did, what did you go out there to see? I just want to know, did you go out there to see a man clothed in soft raiment? Is that what you went out there to see? Did you really go out there to see that? Well, one of the problems that you all have in your world is that you all have that language uh, that's called English. And one of the problems with your English, it, it will do all kind of things that I that I never would have intended. But at least by you having been captured by the Greeks, their language did have some definiteness to it. We're talking about the older Greek, the classical Greek, the Koine Greek. And the word that is used there for soft is malakos. M-A-L-A-K-O-S. Talking about being soft to the touch. It's talking about soft garments. It's talking about being effeminate. Uh, in, in your Bible dictionaries and things that you can look up, you'll see that in what is called BDAG. B-D-A-G. And it pertains to being passive in a same-sex relationship. Effeminate. Catamite of men and boys who are sodomized by other males in such relationships. Those are the kind of soft garments that the catamites would wear. Now, even if you didn't know that, you could look that up and know that history. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm saying that anything is wrong with it. I'm just telling you right off the top, or as you all say, right off the rip. Mm. I'm not unaware of that. What they ought to say is that I've never said anything about uh, bestiality. Mm. Do I have to say that? So let me show you how I address all of that in what is a heading. Go to what your Bible called Matthew chapter 15. And I want you to see when I talk to some people that keep their own tradition. This is one of their traditions that they want to practice homosexuality like they did in Pompeii, like they did in Egypt, like they did in Baal, or even my people, the Hebrews got into it so bad that they would have sodomites at my house oh. and say it worshiped me. And they would have prostitutes. So they, one day the Pharisees had a problem with my disciples not washing their hands the way that they washed their hands and all of that. And they got on, to my, on my disciples and they wanted to know why y'all don't wash y'all hands the way according to the tradition. And I went off on them. I went all the way off. And this is what I said. Then why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? You know what God has said, honor your father and mother. That means they can get in your pocket and get some of your time. Honor your father and mother. And he that curses father and mother, let him die to death. But you say, it's a gift 
I got to give it to God. And whatever you give me profit, and you don't honor your father and mother and your free cause, you say so. So by your tradition, you make not affect the commandment of God. You're a hypocrite. And Isaiah said it. You draw not to God with your mouth, but your heart is way over there in Texas, and your body is over there in Florida. It's way away from me. And in vain you teach, worshiping me the doctrines and the commandments of men, political correctness, progressivism, race stuff, political activism. You teach that as doctrine. If doctrine say that no, the transgender is accepted, you will teach that. You will make not affect the commandment of God. If you teach that polygamy is what we're going to do, you will make not affect the traditions of God. If I made them male and female and you say God didn't know what he's doing, we're going to give them drugs and make them want to be girls and drugs and make them want to be boys and say that they're confused and make it laws and make people lose their job if they tell the truth. You teach for teachings and doctrines the commandments of men and you enforce it by law. You enforce it by guns. You enforce it by besieging people, taking their job so that you can make them poor and make them have famine that they will eventually buckle down to what you say because you will put yourself in the place of God and by that you nullify the commandment of God. I just thought I'd say that to you. And so he, so then it says, I call the multitude, and I say, hear and understand. Not that they go into the mouth defile a man, washing your hands, but that which come out. You drink some wine that don't defile you, it's what comes out. What comes out? We think in defecation and urination, right? Mm -hmm. What you take in your mouth, right. like this, it, it, it better not come out solid. I don't know what kind of calcium stuff or what they call those kidney stones made out. This goes in liquid, come out liquid. You eat something that's fleshly, whatever you can eat, it comes out in a lump. Okay, we'll leave that alone. So my disciples came and said, don't you know the Pharisees were offended when they heard what you said? And did you think I cared? Did you think that I cared that they were offended? I run this. They hypocrites. They teach the commandments of men. Their words have no weight. Their words are not eternal. Do I care? Let me show you how much I care that they were offended. This is what I said. Every plant which my heavenly father has not planted shall be rooted up. If you're going to teach transgenderism, it's going to be rooted up. You're going to teach homosexuality, it's going to be rooted up. If you're going to teach adultery, it's going to be rooted up. If you're going to teach disobedience to your parents, it's going to be rooted up. If you're going to teach being dishonorable to your parents, that's going to be rooted up. The blind teachers, they leave the blind, they both fall into the ditch. But don't you understand that what enters your mouth going your belly into the drought or into the commode or into the water closet or into the hole that you got in the back of the yard? But those things, listen, that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, and Pornia, you all have fornication in your Bible. But in sexual immorality, and in order for you to understand what sexual immorality is, listen and listen to me closely, because an ignorant, unlearned person running their mouth, opening a book that's not given to them. My, my Bible wasn't given to everybody. My Bible was given to the Hebrew people. My Bible was given to them primarily. If you think that I'm lying when I say that my Bible was given to them primarily, let's do something. Let's let you go and listen to what Paul said, because I whipped his tail. I knocked him down on the ground. He wasn't on a horse. But I knocked him on the ground and I blinded him so he could only see what I wanted him to see. And by the time I allowed him to see, he got his mind right. Now I want you to look and see if I'm telling you the truth that this book that we call the Bible, the Holy Scripture, was only, and I do mean only, given to his people, the Hebrew people. Some One person told me, Timmy, that's cultic. I said, you can't, you can't say nothing to me about Christianity and not talk cultic. All the different factions you all got. 
You got Jesus Christ, Latter Day Saints. That's Christian. You got oh, you got Christian Jehovah Witness. You got Christian that worship Ellen G. White. You got Christian that had black people as slaves. You got Christian that walk around with a cross with a daggone D A G O N fish head on his head, and you call him the Papa, the Father, the Pope. You got Eastern Orthodox who walk around bowing down, and you want to say if somebody says something about Hebrew, they are called a physician. Heal yourself. Get the beam out of your eye. You have no room to talk. And so when I say this Bible is given to the Hebrew people, listen what he says to these Gentiles. Ephesians 2 and 1. And you, as he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Okay, so he says, you were once that, and that's who you were. Now, what happens in verse 12? Somebody can say, Tim, you left out the part where they say through gates, through faith. I, I can do that, but I got a point that I'm making. Look at verse 11. I want you to remember that those that don't remember, I want you to know it the first time. Wherefore, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are now called, or who are called uncircumcision, that is, which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands. You were not Hebrews. You were uncircumcised. You were the same kind of thing like Goliath was. You had an uncircumcised lip. You had an uncircumcised wiener, penis, or whatever you want to call it. Verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ. Listen to verse 12. Listen, being aliens, aliens from the commonwealth. Coming from the citizenry of Israel and strangers, listen to me, unacquainted with the covenants of promise. And the Greek here says, Ho and Pengelia. That means covenants of the promise. Because all of the covenants went back to the promise. You were strangers from the covenants of the promise. You had no hope. And you were without God in the world. Talking about salvifically. But now in Christ, you who are sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. Who have broken down the middle wall of partition, have abolished in his flesh the enmity. Even the law of commandments and ordinances to make of himself twain one new man and make in peace. And the commandments and the ordinances, they had commandments to stay away from you all. They had commandments of certain things that were regulations that were blotted out. But that which can remain will remain. We can go through that and if we discuss that later on in the roundtable. The point that I'm making here is when he's talking to Matthew, he's talking to Hebrew people. He's talking to Pharisees. They were Hebrews, the Hasidim. He's talking to the people that he came to. He came to his own. His own received them not. They knew this law and they weren't honoring their father and mother. The Gentiles didn't have that law that was codified and written in the tables of stone. So therefore, when I say that in the 19th verse, that I'm saying out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, and fornication, the words pornea or sexual immorality, they would know that that covers everything in Leviticus 15 and 16, where it talks about bestiality, where it talks about homosexuality, where it talks about adultery, where it talks about laying up with the maid, where it talks about all of these things because this book was written to them. Notice, he didn't go back and say, go back and read what he says on a father and mother. Because I know you know it. And you know that you have obfuscated and gone around and didn't do what was told and you teach your commandments, yet you know the commandment of God. You made it of non-effect. The Gentile didn't have it. And so what does he do? He comes in you got to taste it. 
Because a lot of times people don't understand the scripture or the power of God because they hadn't read enough. Because they had other things that they wanted to do with their life. And so instead of doing God's word, they rather watch TV. And he says, out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts. That's where your coveting comes in. Your coveting, which will break a commandment, murder, commandment, adultery, commandment. Fornication commandments, when you start reading what adultery is and you start breaking down the things that you do, you're stealing, you're false witnesses, and you're blasphemy, taking God's name in vain. These are the things that defile a man. But to eat with unwashing hands defile not the man. Well, but I don't believe that you still spoke against those things. All that stuff sounds good, but I don't believe you. So what is the word pornea? What does the word mean? Unlawful sexual intercourse, prostitution, unchastity. It goes on and tells you any other type of sexual activity that's prohibited. It talks about even laying up with men and everything else that you do with your body sexually that you ought not to do. Now, if you want to say that I never said anything against that, then you have to go ahead and make it that I wasn't writing to people that knew what those things meant. And in order for you to do that, you have to be very disingenuous. Now, I know there are a lot of people in this world that are disingenuous, and they'll make it like I didn't say anything like that. But it's all through the scripture. But I had a man named Paul. And I taught him. His name was Saul. And he taught you that you would not inherit the kingdom of God if you did these things. You all are familiar with that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and 9. Should I repeat it? I trow not. Well, and did that help any? Yeah. I have one more question. Sure. Um, I don't see any questions on the uh, on the Facebook unless it's just not showing up on my phone. So if you see, so would I would I be give could I give the answer from Revelation twenty one um, where he talks about those who will uh, will have their part in the lake of fire and brimstone? Um, I think it's twenty one and eight. Revelation. If I were talking to someone, could. Um, about that subject and say he never said anything about that would that cover that well when you have whoremongers the word is pornos pornos will cover that not only will pornos cover that but a lot of times if people really knew what idolatry was mm -hmm. he would cover that too because in idolatry they, that was part of the worship that you would give yourself as a sexual sacrifice to that God. But pornos and pornea, they are the same kind of words. Okay, what is that word, abominable? Abominable. That word is to abhor. That, may, that word, um, let me pull it. I want to make it talk. Uh, I can make it talk by this. Let me click here. And I click here. The delusimai. Did you hear it? Bell delusimai. Bell delusimai. Okay. I'm going to do it again. I'll do it again. Because uh, somebody else may be trying to hear it on the conference line. The delusimai. Okay. The delusimai. Okay. But that may, not, that may not mean that much for somebody to look it up. But when you look it up, you see the word here to abhor and those other things that with being done like that were also abominations and yet Yeshua talked about people that did not hear his word they would be Sodom and Gomorrah which were known for raping trying to rape the angels all that sexual activity they did that the stuff that they did would even be worse than that because they didn't listen to him how much more someone that did listen to him and still want to practice that kind of lifestyle but he did address it when it, just like if you say if he addressed murder 
And someone said he didn't address hating your brother. John said that's the same thing. But to just come and just say, did he say that we can't man lay with man? Woman say woman lay with other woman. He validated all of the scriptures. Every single one of the scriptures. He said not one jot. Let's let's get that one. Let's just get that one scripture. I believe it's Matthew five. Because I think if nothing else, if somebody, if nobody ever would take anything that you said on that, I'm gonna look and see which verse that is. One jot or one tittle from the law until it all be fulfilled. I'm thinking it'll be around 17. Let's see. Oh, very good. They not I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth, not till I die, not till I rise, till heaven and earth pass, not one yoda, one jot, or one till the decoration on the Hebrew letters shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. I validate the law in what it says. But the premise of your question was wrong, and I didn't address that. I don't love everybody in the sense that everybody's going to be saved. I've already shown before, my love doesn't save you. Why would you think that my love saves you? I never said that my love saves somebody. My love gives you an opportunity. Let, let me go back and show you what I said before. Go to Mark chapter 10, verse number 19. I'll let you go to 18. I'm going to show you that my love is not enough to save you. So to be throwing my love and like that, everything going to be okay. That's an impossibility because I don't contradict myself. In Matthew chapter, I mean in uh, Mark chapter 10, verse number 17. And when he was gone forth in the way, there came one running and kneeled to me. And they said, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That's what he said to me. And I said to him, why, why are you calling me good? What's up? Why are you calling me good? I, I want to know what you're talking about. Why are you calling me be good. Am I supposed to be impressed by your retinue and all your gold and say, why are you calling me good? Do you feel like you can add something to me, some value to me? Do you think that if you can come in, I'm going to let you be on my platform and talk as if you were a football player or an entertainer or a has-been singer? You're going you're gonna to come up here and move and get in front of my disciples? Why are you calling me good? So, I said to him, there is none good but one. That's God. You see, what I'm going to get him to do is ask him, are you calling me God? <laughs> you see, you're asking me, what can you do to inherit eternal life? That's what you're asking me. You're asking as if I can tell you. So I just want to address the first thing. Why are you calling me good? People love to be called good, even when they're wicked. So why are you doing it? Do you understand there's only one good, that's God? Are you going to still say I'm good with that information? Are you going to say, well, other people are good and they don't have to be God? You didn't say that. So I ask you, do you know the commandments? Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor father and mother. Well, sometimes people say, what do you mean by defraud? Uh, well, I just want you to, I just want you to just tell me that. And guess what he said to me? Master, all these things I've observed from my youth of, I've, I've done it. I've done it. Do you know what he said to me? I've done it, and he never even took into consideration that I never said anything about having no other gods before me, not to make a graven image, 
not to take my name in vain. I didn't even mention remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I left out commandments. I didn't even, and, and dealing with the one coveting? Well, anyway, so he said that to me. And I looked at him. I loved him. Look at your verse 21 in your Bible, Mark chapter 10. I loved him. I'm looking at him. I love him. I love you, son. Son, I love you. There's only one good. That's God. Do you still think I'm good? Because I'm getting ready to talk to you just like I'm good. You want to know what it takes to inherit eternal life? I know what your problem is in life. I know where your confidence is. I know where your security is. I know where your protection is. I know where your hope is. So I looked at him and I said, only one thing you lack. Go and sell whatever you have and give it to the poor. And you'll have treasure in heaven. Give up all of it. Give up all your security. Give up your status. Give up the very thing you thought I was going to be impressed with because I'm not impressed with your stuff. Give it up and you'll have treasure in heaven. I love you. I'm looking at you and I love you. I know what you're going to do. I love you. 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 Well, in the Bible that you all have told you that he was sad. He went away grieved. I told him to, to give up everything he had and to take up his cross, take up his cross and follow me. In other words, not a life of luxury no more, not a life of autonomy anymore. Take up your cross, be subjective to me and follow me as an itinerant preacher. And the man, the man, when I said it, he, he was sad. He was sad that I said that and he went away grieved. He had great possessions. He was sad. And I didn't beg him to come back. I didn't say, please, just, just give a tip. I, if this is your best life ever, the, the covenant is the tithe. The covenant is the tithe. So a seed. So a seed anyway. I did not tell him any of that. It wasn't important to me. So I looked around to everyone that was there, all of my disciples, and I said, how hardly shall they which have riches enter into the kingdom of God. I said that. And my disciples looked at me, and they were astonished at what I said. So I, I said, listen, children, it is hard for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Children, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to come into God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. I'm saying this so that my disciples will never be impressed by your money, your wealth, your retinue. I don't want my disciples impressed by that. I want them impressed by the word of God and that God is the protector and everything they do is to bring honor to him. And my disciples were astonished out of measure. The next guess what they said. Well, who can be saved? I mean, Quaytan, that's the name I'm going to give him. Quaytan got plenty. Quaytan has got the money. He has stacks. Stacks on deck. And I just looked around and I say, with men, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. It's possible if that person is willing to do what I told that young man to do. If he's willing, God can give that to somebody. And did that help a little taste? Thank you, precious. Gary, did that help a little taste? Yes, it did. I like the fact that you did include um, Paul because the, the um, scripture does, you know, when you look at that um, passage, 
passage in Luke, and this may seem like I'm going way off when the when the guy wanted release. He said they have Moses and the prophets. And then, you know, what if you keep on reading the scripture you see how Ephesians will talk about that, but men get up with those who have been under the uh, instruction of Christ. So I thought of Peter, Second Peter, I think it's two and six, where he's blasting um, people in history, and he does bring up Gomorrah. So um, I thought it was good. Well, thank you. I, it's just the fact that when we start looking at the scripture and start pulling this juice out, it's so many good things in there for us. Is there are there any of is there anything else that we'd like to have in our in our round table tonight? I have a clip I wanted you to hear. I don't please play it. I can't play it on my phone. Okay. Uh, what is it? Or where is it? It's in, it's on YouTube. Okay, let me go to YouTube. Give me just a second. I can pull it up, and we can hear that that magnificent clip. Cause I'm I'm pretty sure Gary wants to hear it. He's such a wonderful fella. YouTube clip. Close that. Open this. I'm op I'm there. Okay, so it's um it's true news. True news. It'll probably sound better on your phone. Okay. I do true news. Okay, so it's true news and it says your father is the devil. The devil? Yes. Let me have it. Is it out of there? Because I know exactly where it is. Okay. I may have it, but here, you could take clip. it. Not, I mean, I'm oh, do you have the clip Sorry. is? Okay. Well, Gary, these, these are the things that I go through when I, when I hear people say things. And it's like, that's not how the Lord Jesus taught. Which one we do, precious Lord? Oh, I thought Gary had got dropped off some kind of. I don't think so. Gary, you're still with us, aren't you? We're back. We, there was a pause, but I, I just think um, you all were um, doing stuff. Because I'm not watching. I think people watching can tell. Okay, okay, go back and check your... Can you check your Facebook on, the, on your computer? Okay. Facebook. The window. Okay, it says live. Any comments? I don't see any comments at all. I see one by Dre. It said, "Why do people say you have unconditional love?" So I'll I'll deal with, I'll deal with that when after you play your clip. Are you going to deal with that and then you find the clip? Well, the reason that people say. That I have unconditional love is that they don't know me. They want to make me in their image and in their likeness. I never had unconditional love. I didn't have it before I took on humanity, and I don't have it now. Let me tell you what they don't want to tell you. Open in your Bible and you will see how unconditioned, I mean, how much conditions I have. On my love. I have a lot of conditions in my love. First of all, I don't even let anybody just abide in my love. I tell people right up front. It says in John 15, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. It's conditional. You don't keep my commandments. You don't abide in my love. I'm through. I, I can jettison you out of the way. I don't have to listen to what people say. I don't have to listen to that theology. I don't have to listen to Calvinistic theology where it talks about irresistible grace. Because when they really read the Bible, you'll see that even the apostles say that you always resist the Holy Ghost. That's what Stephen say that the people resist. I don't have unconditional love. I say, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. It is so conditional. Let's go back one. 
Just go back to your 14th chapter. Because people have the tendency to put words in my mouth that I didn't put in my own mouth. Go to your John chapter 14. Because I'm going to show you, not only do I, I don't only have um, conditional love, my father has conditional love. Listen to what I said in John chapter 14, verse 21. He that has my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me, there's a qualifier, he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And I will love him. And will manifest myself to him. Well, Judas thought the Iscariot. Then he asked me, well, how are you going to manifest? How are you going to manifest yourself to us and not the world? Well, I told him, if a man love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Well, for some people, that's not enough. So what I'll do is I'll show them. I, I show them everything is about me. You see, sometimes people think everything is about them. And they think that I'm going to supposed to be like what they do when they have what they call unconditional permissive love for their children. They don't understand who I am. The earth is mine and the fullness thereof, the world and all y'all that dwell therein. But I told them, I told them I'm divine. I told them my father's the husband man. I told them every branch in me that bears fruit in your book, John 15 and 2. Every branch that's in me that bears fruit or that don't bear a fruit. I, I told them at that time, I, I talked about the one that bear fruit, I purge them. But the one that don't bear fruit, I take them away. No one is plucking them out of my hand. I take them away. And every branch that bear fruit, I work on them. I cut, I nip, I tuck, I purge. Because I want it to bring forth more fruit. I want works. I want works. I want works. I demand works. Um, it's conditional. If you don't bear works, if you don't work for me, if you're not my servant, if you think you're just going to have faith in me, you're a damnable liar, and you're not going to be with me, you got to bear fruit, or else I'm going to take you away. And I'm not taking you to heaven. So, for those that's in me, that hear me, they're clean through the word which I've spoken. I told them to abide in me, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abides in the vine. I say, you don't see none of those. You see those vines? They bear fruit because they're in the vine. It's the same way you, unless you're in me, you can't bear fruit. Understand this. I'm the vine. I am the vine. Make no doubt about it. It's not you, Israel, no more. You brought forth wild grapes. Isaiah told you that. I'm the vine. You are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, he's going to bring forth much fruit. He's going to obey me. He's going to do my will. He's going to work. He's not going to all the time look around. I can't. And somebody tell you you can't be perfect in this legalistic. That government, do you hear me saying you got to work? Does my word not matter? Do you not care what my word said? I said, if you don't bear fruit, you carry it away. But you like your pastor, don't you? You like your bishop, don't you? You're like the apostle, don't you? And you're defiled. Well, I say I'm the vine. You're the branches. If you're in me, you bring forth much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. You're thrown away. I've heard people say about me that I won't throw you away. I've heard preachers say that I won't throw you away. Do you know that's from hell to contradict me? Mm. Did they die for you? Mm. Did they live for you? Did they rise for you? Are they the only mediator between you and God? 
I will throw you away. For not working. It's salvific. But they'll tell you what I said before the cross doesn't matter after the cross. So this doesn't matter. How stupid will you be? You'll be just like Mother Eve was when I told them not to eat from that fruit of the tree of the garden. And she saw it was something good to eat. And she listened to him over me. She let him contradict me. I said, you will surely die. And he said, you but won't but surely but but die but 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 Eva, you but won't but die. You can't die. He has unconditional love. I told him as a branch. You got it in your verse six. He says, "If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered." That means you're dead. And men gather them up. And cast them into the fire, and they are burned. They are damned before me. They are damned, damned, damned before me. But if you abide in me, qualifier, if you abide in me and my words, that means you're keeping my commandments, abide in you, you will ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Why? Because that's what glorifies my Father. That you bear much fruit. And guess what? So shall you be my disciple. That's a, do you all understand when I say that? That's a verb in the future tense. If you do what I say, if you produce what I say, you'll be my disciple. And as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Commandment time, continue you in my love. If you keep my commandments to bear fruit, you will abide in my love. That's what I mean about being in the, in the vine. Keep my commandments, you will abide in the vine. But you listening to your preachers. They tell you what I, what I say don't matter. You know, one of my one of my disciples, he dealt with the issue like that. And he told people about being unfruitful and unproductive. Go to your Bible to first Peter, I mean second Peter chapter two. You need to know these things so that you can see not that I have to validate myself. And I'm gonna do it for you. Now when you look at Simon Peter and he talked, and I mean, he came a long way. He turned his way. He was damned one time. But he repented. He wept. He repented. And he didn't deny me like that ever again. Because I have forgiveness for those that repent. Well, Peter talked about the precious faith that he had. And he tells the people, after I died, what you have. Because a lot of you all want to be saved and have the power to speak in tongues. You want to have the power to heal. You want to have the power to tell the future. You let women and men walk around and call themselves prophet. That's their name. I'm prophet this, prophet that, prophet this. I didn't even go around calling myself prophet this, prophet that, and I am the ultimate prophet. They could walk around calling themselves apostle this, apostle this. I didn't walk around calling myself apostle all the time. And I, and I was when I was on earth, God's apostle. And they walk around bishop this and all of these magnificent titles. And you honor them. But you ignore the man that I sent. But listen what Peter says. Peter says, according as my divine power, in 2 Peter 1 and 3, according as my divine power have given unto you all all things that pertain unto life and godliness, all things. You want power to be called this apostle, this bishop, the tongue, the healing, to tell the future, to know the past, to get wealth. What about the power that I give you that pertain unto life and godliness? Through the knowledge of me, I call you to glory and virtue. I am the one that sent the Holy Spirit. 
It gives you great and precious promises that you might be able to partake of my divine nature, having escaped the corruption, the corruption, the ungodliness, the moral corruption, the pornea that is in the world through lust. And he told you besides all of this, add to your faith virtue and virtue knowledge. You don't want to learn anything. You want to be stupid. And the knowledge tempers and the temperance patience and the patience godliness and godliness brotherly kindness and the brotherly kindness charity. And if these things be in you, if they be in you and abound, you want the abundant life. You think in money. I'm telling you about the abundant life of doing righteously. I came that you might have a life and have it more abundantly. I want you to bear fruit. And my father wants you to bear much fruit. That's why you're being purged. If these things being you are bound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful. In the knowledge of God, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, he told you that you would not be barren and unfruitful in me. That means you wouldn't have to be cast away and burned. But if you lack these things, you're blind. But they told you, you don't have to do these things. And you cannot see a far off. And that you have forgotten you were purged from your sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Make your calling and election sure because, the, because he told them that I don't have unconditional love. Make your calling and election sure. Make it. Make it verified. For if you do these things, he said, you never fall. And then he said, for so an interest shall be. That's future tense. Minister to you abundantly like you have brought fruit in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you all don't really want me to talk about all the things that I showed them when I gave the book of the Revelation, what they had to do. My love is not unconditional. It's not, it has conditions. It always has had conditions. You think you get away? I give them in the book of Leviticus before I come to earth. I let them know the covenant worth both sides. I do mine, you do yours. I empower you to do yours. It's like I empowered Noah to build the ark. I gave him the blueprint. I told him what to do. I gave him the wood to be right there. I'm the one that sent the animals to be in the ark. But he had to do something. I gave them the ability to fight. I was right there. And Joshua thought I was just a regular man. But I let Joshua know who I was. And I said, Joshua, I'm the one going out before you to fight. The battle is mine. You think Moses parted the Red Sea? You think Moses gave them manna? You 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 don't know the scriptures or the power of God. Dreamy, does that help any? It might not have helped any. We may have just totally lost. And Dreamy, do you think that helped her any? Because I I don't I. Oh. Okay. She may, Andrina said she may have answered on Facebook, and I did. I didn't yes, know. Did. Okay. We're not in the we're not in the second part right now. Okay, she's she's a beautiful lady, and she's your wife and my sister. You got your clip ready, Andrina. Andrina has a clip, and then after she has a so, clip, go ahead. So on True News, they're talking about that. Um, the Jews want to get rid of the New Testament. They say it's anti-Semitic. And this is this is actually a debate that Michael Brown had with another uh, a rabbi, a so what they call a rabbi. And so he this is on True News' planet, and we're gonna say that this is fair use, it's just for educational purposes only. <laughs> And no money will be made from playing this clip. So you have to say that now. Um, Play it right, by, right there by the, by the, uh, the machine. How many times has Botech and Brown quote debated? 22 times. 22 times. That's a tour. Exactly. That's a commercialized tour. That's a propaganda tour. It, that's a, as much of a debate as professional wrestling is wrestling. 
So let's play this uh, video. This might be a good chance for you guys to, because this is a long one, isn't it? Um, Summer 28 for control. 28. This is the Kabbalists. Who remind, I'm reminding you, Botech is a Kabbalist. Quotes Maimonides, the German debate. This is where he talks about the 450 anti-Semitic verses in the New Testament Bible. Watch this. My friends, I hold in my hand the Christian Bible. This is the Hebrew Bible, what Christians call the Old Testament, which is a little bit derogatory. As it Can you see it? Can you see it on the screen? And this is the New Testament. When Mike quotes passages from the prophets who criticize the Jewish people, they are spread liberally throughout this ent the entire width of this large book. When we speak about castigations, condemnations, attacks on the Jews, for example, of being the children of Satan, there are 450 in this small book. They average two per page. I want to read you a small synopsis of the New Testament. And I want you to tell me, given that there are essentially two groups discussed in the New Testament, the Romans, the occupiers, and the Jews who are being occupied, who is this referring to? Jew, okay, who is this referring to? Vipers and poisonous snakes. Hard-hearted hypocrites. I'm going to Thieves put it on the, on, the, on the thing to the hold blind, it for me. Leading the blind. Because I'm going to cheat. People who reject God's commandments and reject God's purpose. People who plotted on multiple occasions to kill God incarnate in flesh and eventually did. People who said that God's blood should be on them and on their children forever. Matthew 27. People who said that they are filled with yeast and arrogance. People who have no love for God in their hearts. People who don't know Jesus nor his father. And finally, people who are descendants of their father, the devil. Are we speaking Good. of the Romans or the Jews? Anyone want to guess? If I can raise it up. Come on, help me here. Are we speaking of the Romans, the ancient occupier? Murderous, bloody, brutal Rome or the Jews? We Jews are a righteous people. We're tired of hearing that we deserve what we get. The Holocaust was not because we don't believe in Jesus. The Holocaust was because humanity and Germany turned to barbarity. Let me prove to you for a quick moment that portions of the New Testament were edited to make the Jews look murderous. In Acts chapter 9, verse 23, the story is told about the Apostle Paul, quote, after many days had passed, the Jews conspired to kill Paul. But Paul, Saul, learned of their plot, and one night his disciples took him and lowered him in a basket through a window in the wall. So who's trying to kill Paul? The murderous Jews. You'll soon discover how many times the Jews are described as murderous in the New Testament. But the real story told by Paul himself in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 is this. In Damascus, the governor under King Aratus, ally of Rome, had the city of the, Damas, of the Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me, Paul. But I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands. Do you understand what's happening here? The Romans and their allies are trying to kill Paul because Jesus' followers are claiming that Jesus is the... Jewish king, which is a capital offense to Rome. You have to worship the emperor. But in Acts, it is changed. It's no longer the Romans who are trying to kill Paul. It is the Jews. And if that's not anti-Semitism, a blood libel, then I don't know what is. And yet we're told Pilate is sitting there, Matthew 27, arguing with the Jews who are praying for Jesus' blood. Crucify him. Let Barabbas go. Barabbas is a murderer. Let him go. And suddenly Pilate, genocidal mass murderer, suddenly cares for the leader of a tiny sect. And he says to the Jews, bring a pitcher of water. I need to wash my hands. I wanted for the historical record that while I've killed tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, I suddenly care about one Jew 
And then it suddenly says in Matthew that all the Jews claimed his blood be upon us and upon our children. Do you know how many Jews died throughout the centuries because of that one verse? Do you know how many of my people were disemboweled, burned at the stake, expelled, and ultimately, as Christian anti-Judaism morphed into racial anti-Semitism, gassed because the charge of deicide was believed? America is an imperfect country. But we know the difference between patriotism is whether you essentially believe in the nation and its mission or whether you give up and say, let's replace them with someone else. That is the anti-Semitism of the New Testament. That the Jews were replaced. That the Jews were discarded. That the Jews, John says, are quite literally the children of Satan. Do you know what demonic power of which you must be possessed to kill God. Do you know how dark you have to be to kill God? And if you believe that someone is that evil, would you have a problem killing that person, burning him at the stake, kicking him out of your country with his children with nothing to eat when he's the spawn of the devil? It's for this reason that the Vatican itself wrote, quote, some New Testament references hostile or less favorable to Jews have their historical context. This is the Vatican in conflict between the nascent church and the Jewish community. Certain controversies reflect Christian Jewish relations long after the times of Jesus. Translation, they inserted these verses 40, 50 years after the death of Jesus to destroy the Jews and exonerate the Romans. Now, why would they do that? Simple logic. Our hands are stained with blood. It it will not change until my dear friend Mike Brown and my dear friend Mitch Glazer and all my friends at Chosen People Ministries, and we're all going out to dinner afterward because we're friends, until they get up and say, we utterly renounce and repudiate now and forever a belief that Jews who don't believe in Jesus are going to hell, Until that is stated emphatically and clearly, then the hatred, God forbid, even if it's not wanted, might just continue. Hey, I want to get this real plain to Rabbi. All right, you all. I want to know what somebody have to say other than me. No, I want you to say. Oh, you want me to answer. Oh, okay. I thought you okay, said you. Okay, you can wait. You can wait. I, 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 Gary, Gary, did you did you hear it? I did. Was it clear? It was clear. What do you what do you, what what did you have to say about that? Well, I think he's doing a, a great deal of parsing, and he is not looking at history as it shows a reflection of reality that actually took place and how it affects what's going on now. On it, and he seems to be just really taking it that, uh, in a sense, taking it personally. That it, the Jews, first of all, could do no wrong. Also, if we start looking historically at um, who the actual Hebrew people was, is he one of these people who went from Europe and who needed to escape some type of persecution, and then they could go to Israel and claim another identity? even though they didn't know it, but just claim that identity and now say that he is Jewish. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's just a multiplicity. To me, it seems a problem there. And so he's talking about taking someone else's identity when it seems that, I, 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 I don't know what he looks like, but it seems that there's a possibility that he's done it himself. But to change where the scripture is saying that Rome wanted to kill Paul and then to say that um, it was switched because now in, in other parts you're saying that the, the Jews want to do that. It, there's just, there's just, he's not even being, he, there's no integrity in what he's saying. I don't know what his agenda is, but it, it seems like something's there. So it, just, just, a, just a lot there. That's, that's how I'll start off anyway, but utter nonsense. I want to add this because he, he said something about blood libel. And he said that for the Jews, what what Jesus was claiming and the people who were believing in him, 
that is blood libel that is idolatry and that death is that it that's worthy of death he's saying that right now he's saying he's not just saying it was then he's saying it right now that if you believe in this in these writings of the new testament and if you believe that that you have to believe in jesus it's blood libel i i i, I may that's what i thought i heard did you hear that I, I didn't have to hear I mean I didn't hear that word like that because I didn't pay it I, I was doing something else but okay. I wait a minute I heard him say that you're you're responsible I may not have caught the word libel okay. but everything in the tenor and the context of it was saying that everything in it was wicked and ungodly and first of all who said you were a Jew really let, let's be this man right here was supposed to be a Jew Arthur Kostner Kostner he said you were Kosars, and he's white as you are. Go look him up. But you took and you stole an identity, and you say all of those people over there that are, that you stole the land from the Palestinians with the Balfour re, uh, uh, Agreement with Theodore Herzl. You moved people out of the land. You took the land, like Dr. Anish Sharosh that I used to listen to. You took the land from the Palestinian people that were true Christians, Christians that really did believe in following God. You took the land. You upset those people. That's why you have all those problems over there in Israel now because the UN determined you all were going to do that with the bankers. And the thing that Hitler did, you still want to make that like the greatest thing ever and all of the black people that have been killed and slaughtered and raped and you all are the ones sending porn throughout the world, Goldstein, Bernstein, everything that I watch, all of the shows, Chuck Lorre, when he do the Big Bang Theory, Gary K. Marshall, I look at the entertainment that you all do, and you want to say that it's liable? What about the liability when you when you promote all of the black people dancing, women showing their butt, popping their butt, making their vagina poke out where men would want to have sex with them, and you got them popping their breasts everywhere, and then you got the men with their pants hung down, you show murder, rape, and killing, and you're moving, disemboweling people, and you're talking about you? You're not even Hebrew. You don't get Hebrew from your mother. You get it from the father. But what you want to do, because you control the money, and because they control the media, you can make black people like hate white people that are not what are called Jewish. And you can let the what you call the white people that are not Jewish be, take the downfall and get black people to fight against them, and you stand back with your hands like this, like nothing happened. You can do all this chaos because when you have the money, and everybody supports you, and you got all these churches sending money to Israel, saying that Israel are the people of God. You can act like we're not, and you can't tell me that none of the Igbos people, the Limba people, the Falasha people, and the other people that live over there, the Moors, and all of those people were not Hebrew because you have you got too much documentation showing it. And so you want to say that the Jews didn't do that. And then you, you show that you have a great ignorance of even the Torah and the writings and the Kef, and the Ketavim and the Nevi'im. You, got, you show, you know, because even in that, it showed that you murdered all the prophets. Not you, the Hebrew people. It's been showing that they murdered. It's been showing that they raped. It's been showing that they uh, uh, had other gods. So to just say that the New Testament, all of a sudden they got good. How did we get scattered? Trace your lineage back. Titus destroyed the temple in 70 AD. Show me anthropologically, ge geographically, and philologically that you, you, Botek, you've never beat Dr. Brown in a debate, and I don't believe Dr. Brown is a Hebrew. He claims to be a Messianic Jew. He might be. I know not. But I know that the first time when he was having a real debate with somebody that knew what what was going on with the haplo groups and the genealogical background, he said that those Jewish people would be darker than this. That table was mahogany brown, wasn't it? A gold. It was darker than this. Oh, no shades. He said that's yeah. the color that they would be. But when we get pictures of Jerry Seinfeld, and what's that woman name on the view that got all that mouth? Joy Behar. And you get, oh, oh my goodness, you want this. 
those of you that don't know the word of God that's the group that can ban you what you call your New Testament and they have the ability to give people this right here this star and many of the people that say that they are Hebrew they go through them let them say that they are Jews they give you money to set up in your neighborhoods and then the word of God be tossed asunder again so you think that the world will never get to the place where it, will, where it will accept God's Messiah? It will, whether it has to come through bomb, famine, or whatever. They're gunning for us. I've told you all before, I don't like Christianity. Christianity goes along with that. Christianity loves to squash down what God's words say because it's going to cause some fear and some consternation. You better listen. When Botex says that, he has a lot of audience. He's not that brilliant, but he's come up with something like Christopher Hitchin did for the atheists, or like Richard, Daw Richard Dawkins did for the atheists. Learn your Bibles. Learn the Word of God. Learn to look behind the English. Because what he was saying is he's blaming the Bible for the people being killed that Hitler said were not true Aryans. He didn't like the way that they did the money. A lot of, a lot of other stuff. But there have been more black people killed than them, but we don't have the money. They were sacrificed. They were sacrificed over there and they were given somebody else land, just took the land. Go look it up sometime. Theodore Herzl, Bell for Agreement. And, and the Declaration of Balfour, go look it up and look at the people in it and read about them. And you got something you want to add? I was going to say that he was mainly speaking of the New Testament. Yes. So I think what happened is I didn't, I, I couldn't, um, I didn't actually watch all of the video. But what he's actually saying is that Dr. Brown's answer was that um, the Old Testament is replete. Same thing I was saying. He's condemning the, um, Israel and saying that these are the things that you all have done. But he said, oh, it's scattered. It's it's scattered all through it. All these books. And it's, it's scattered all through the all of these books, so many. But this is just packed full. The New Testament is just packed full. And so we need to condemn it. And I'm hearing that he wants to get rid of the New Testament, that they added things that is anti-Semitic and that he's actually telling Dr. Brown in, in essence, you have to renounce Christ. Anyway, he answers if you want to play that, but he does answer. Well, let people look it up. That. Let people start looking up stuff. Right. But so one of the things about that is what he doesn't understand is that it doesn't do that. It, it says in Romans chapter 11 that they were broken off. I mean the real Hebrews, that they could be grafted in again. It says it come to the Jews first, then also the Greek for hearing the word of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, that just shall live by faith. Paul said he wished he could be a curse to God for the Jews. And he was talking about real Hebrew people. He said, I am a Hebrew. I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He didn't say I'm from Europe. He didn't say I'm a Kosar. He didn't say I come from the Caucasus Mountain. I'm talking about just one book. This one, not even a lot of them. We tell you that when you hear these things, there is more to it than what you say. But the next time I talk about it, I'm going to be a little more calm. I'm going to be a little more sweet. Because what will happen is people will say, he's upset. But the other men get to be upset. But you know, I'm like David and I'm like Jonathan right now. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Do you want you want to start looking at what people do? Look at what they do before they get to condemn. I'm gonna do a couple of more things. I'm gonna do one more thing, and I'm glad you brought that up. We'll probably have to discuss that again because I don't really have anybody saying anything about it. Let's Dre and Gary want to. I want to say this last thing. Well, the last thing that I have is about faith. Okay. People will say that your faith has saved you. You're saved by grace alone and faith alone. And I want to show what our Messiah says about that. So let's go to Luke chapter. Let's go to Luke chapter. Let's 
go to Luke 7, 36, okay? I want to give you three instances about your faith. You're saved by faith alone, grace alone. Let's see what kind of faith we're talking about. So we're going to talk about a whore again, okay? A person that's considered to be a whore. And they're not the worst persons in the world because many ungodly men have loved whores. Uh, they, they, they make it easier for you to get with because other than that, you're going to have to try to make somebody one so that you can have your activities. But in Luke chapter 7, verse 37, it's a beautiful passage here. Well, it comes to the place where Pharisees want me to come to eat. So a woman of the city came in and she was a sinner. And she knew I was sitting down to eat at the Pharisee's house. And she brought in this she brought in this nice alabaster box of ointment and she stood at my feet behind me. She was just crying, crying. And she began to wash my feet with her tears and to wipe them with her long hair. And she kissed my feet that would now cleanse with her tears. And she took her ointment and anointed my feet. Now the, now the Pharisee that had bid me he saw it, and he, he started talking within himself, saying, if he knew what kind of woman this was that touched me, she's a sinner. And in himself, it's like, I should let her touch me, and as if he's better than her. But I answered him, and I said, Simon, I got something to say to you. And Simon, like, Master, say on. Not because I was his master, as you called master. That means teacher, say on. There was a certain creditor that had debtors, and one owed him 500 pence, and the other owed 50. Now, you might not know what a pence is, but imagine you owe me $500, and the other owed 50. It's a lot easier to pay the 50 than the 500, right? Especially if you're broke. And when, listen, and when they had nothing to pay, he forgave them both. I, I'm going to let you both slide. I said to him, Simon, which one do you think loved me the most? And you know what Simon said? I suppose, I, I guess, I... Um, I assume, it's just a stupid question he felt in his mind. It's just a stupid question. I assume that he that forgave, that he forgave the most. And I told him, you have rightly judged. You see, a wicked man can judge rightly. Doesn't mean he judges rightly on everything. But he can judge rightly. That's why they get condemned. Because they know what's right. And, and I say, you have rightly judged. And I turned to the woman and I said, Simon, see this woman right here? You see this woman, when I came to your house, you didn't give me hospitality. You didn't, you didn't give me the greeting of the kiss. You didn't wash my feet. But this woman, she not, not only didn't kiss me on the cheek, she washed my feet with her tears and she kissed my feet that had been going through the ground where animals and people spit, animals do their business or whatever, but she didn't care. She loved much. And she wiped it with the hairs of her head. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with ointment. I want to tell you something, Simon. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, if you're already good in your own mind, if you don't feel you need me, you love little. So I say, I said to her, her sins were forgiven. And all those that sat down and eat, they begin to say, who is he that forgives sins? And I'm looking at them and I realize that I'm making them realize who I say that I am, but I don't have a problem with that because I am who I say that I am because I am. Did you get it? I am. And they just said that me began to say within themselves, who is he that forgiveth sin also? And he says, thy faith have saved thee. 
Go in peace. Now, there's a part in that that says she loved much. And there's a part that says your faith has saved you. I, I want you all to know that, that are watching this. When people tell you you're saved by grace alone and faith alone, was her faith alone? Her faith was manifested by all of that work, all of that humility, all of that being to be ridiculed, to be looked at what manner a woman this is. She stood behind me. She cried. She cried. Here's my one chance, my one chance to get it and get it right. Everybody want to use me, abuse me, drop their load of semen in me and call me a dog, call me a whore, but you won't do that to me. My one chance to be clean. My one chance to be redeemed. And I know that I'm wrong. Help me. Help me. Did she cry? Did she she saw that you didn't do me right. She didn't feel worthy to touch me in a place for my head or my face, but the place where I have walked through the, through the dust of the ground. She humbled herself. So I said, your faith has saved thee. Go in peace. If you're going to be saved, what, what they say, being saved by faith alone, does your faith resemble hers. Well, I understand sometimes that's not clear, so go to in your Bible, Mark chapter 2. Because I want you to see what faith alone should mean, but it doesn't mean when you all talk about me. You see, I went to Capernaum after a few days. It was noise in, at a person's house in your book, Mark. Two and two. And straightway many people gathered together. There was no room to receive the people. Uh, when he made it room to get to the door. And I was preaching the word to them so hard, so good. I was giving them the word that would change souls, that would cause people to come to God, or that would damn them forever. Because not only am I the prince of peace, but I come to break a sword. I come to divide. And guess what? If some people come in and they were bringing a sick person that had palsy. This person was paralytic. And four people were, listen, they brought, that's a verb, they were carrying, that's a verb, they had to exercise the strength to carry the weight. And look, when they couldn't get to the house, they must have set him down somewhere and they climbed up on the house and they took the ceiling tiles off the roof where where I was preaching. And it just opened up and then the daylight was there. I was preaching. I was preaching when that happened. And and when they broke it up, they went and got and they struggled, got the man up there, and they let him down. The one that was paralyzed with the sick of the palsy. And when I saw their faith. I said to the sick of the palsy, son, your sins be forgiven. I want you to understand. How did I see their faith? Did I, did, did I see that they said that they confessed me as Lord? Did I see that they believe in my heart that God would one day raise me from the dead? I saw their work. I saw their struggle. I saw their risk. I saw the effort that they made. That's how I saw their faith. In the same way I saw that woman's love. And he said, son, your sins be forgiven. And there were certain scribes sitting when I said that. And they reasoned in their hearts that I was speaking blasphemies. He can't forgive sin. Who he think he is? He think he missed the big stuff? Does he really think he missed the big stuff? Who did he think he is? So, I, I knew what they were thinking. So I just, by the Spirit, knew what they were saying in, in, within themselves. And I said, why do you think this way? Why, why do you think this evil in your heart? Tell me something. 
would it be easier for me to say it for people to believe it that your sins are forgiven you couldn't really tell if they're forgiven or not I know he'd know the father would know the spirit would know but you wouldn't so let me say this which is easy to say that or take up your bed and walk well, it's easy to say your sin be forgiven because we can't prove that it's not. we just going to say you got a devil. Because we know only God can make a paralyzed person get up and walk. Okay, so since now you understand the dilemma that you're facing, but that you may know that the Son of Man, even before he go receive a kingdom and authority and power, has power on earth to forgive sins. I told the paralytic, <laughs> get up take your bed and walk. And he got up and took his bed and walked. He should have been there. Because, you know, the other people, they were glorifying the Father when they saw that. It was it was a magnificent thing. But I'm telling you, when you all hear people tell you all that you have, uh, is faith alone, you have no works, look at what I've shown you that I see as faith. Well, I'll give you one more before I call it good night. Go to Luke chapter 5. I want you to see. I just want you to see how I see faith. I see faith done by works. My brother James wasn't wrong when he said that to you all, but you all listen to other people. Listen to James. I mean, Luke. I don't know why I said James, but it's Luke chapter 5, verse 17. It came to pass on a certain day I was teaching. I, I was after teaching. Pharisees and the doctors of the law, they were sitting there that day. And they came out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of Yahweh was on me to heal. I was doing, I was doing the Father's work. And behold, they brought a bed, a man taken into palsy. And they couldn't find the faith to come in. It's the same one. And he saw their faith. I'm looking for the one. You can look it up for me. I'm looking for the one where I healed the woman that had had that. She had uh, had an issue. She had been bound. And she she struggled through the crowd. And when she struggled through the, the crowd, the touched me. And I just said, who touched me? And I wanted you to see that. Because I, I, I got to go and look it up for you. Because I know if you don't get it, I will. Because I got this computer here. <laughs> Even if Gary want to tell me he can, he's able. He's got power. And I do like him. Let's try, let's try Luke 8. And let's look at 45. We're in, the, we're in the same book, but we're in the wrong house. Luke 8. And we'll go to 40, 40, 42. And the man's only daughter was 12. And she was already considered dead. And a woman, and he was going to raise her from the dead. The woman having an issue of blood 12 years. She spent all her living on the doctors, the physician, and couldn't be healed of any. Now notice this. She came behind. That's a verb. Came behind. Is that is that a faith? Is that a work? She had to get there. Look, if you've never been low blood, if you men, if you've never lost blood, you don't understand what women go through on their cycle. Now that don't mean I understand what they go through on their cycle, but I did have a dual denim also one time, and my hemoglobin was down to seven, and I realized how weak that I was. So I know that the loss of blood is the loss of oxygen. The loss of oxygen is weak. This woman has had this twelve years, sweetheart. Without putting you on the spot all the way. Can you imagine 12 years of losing blood in that place? Uh -uh. No. Imagine how expensive that would be nowadays too. So 12 years. She's had this issue. It must not have just been a little issue. It was a, a big issue. But it says. She's had it. She spent all her living trying to get rid of it. Physicians couldn't heal. She came behind and touched and touched two verbs. The board of his garment and immediately her issue was staunched. Her issue was stopped. Obviously, this was not something that just go periodically. It must have been a continual flow. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng and press you. Who what do you mean you touched me? And I had to say, somebody touched me. 
I perceive virtue has gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not here, she came trembling. Humility like that other woman that washed his feet, trembling and falling down like that other woman did his feet, and she declared unto him before all and before all the people for the cause that she had touched him, and how she was healed immediately. And when he yet spake, there came one. I'm sorry. And then I said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Your faith has made thee whole. Go in peace. Why is it when people talk about the faith, they make it where it's just mental? Why is it just considered to be mental? This woman did the worst, and, I'm, and that's it. I'm saying their faith, in every case, when he saw their faith, it was the same way James did. See not a man's faith, you see it by his works. If she had a dead faith, she said, I believe, I believe I'm healed. I'm going to speak, I'm healed, I'm going to declare it, I'm going to decree it. This woman went and struggled through to get there. Well, I thought I'd bring that out because that's what I wanted to do today when I was going through the book of Luke. Anyone else before we shut down, close down our Bible talk for the night? I think it was kind of heavy, but imagine how many years you could go through church and never get to have any of this kind of discussion. Did I hear somebody on the conference line? Go ahead, Gary. I think I think some people with the first example will relegate that to a, a form of worship and the presentation of what that particular woman who did who uh, watched his feet that would be worship, and so we worship him, and, and that is maybe that's a sacrament or something. They yeah. they really could, Gary. I'm glad you. I'm glad your mind is on full full effect. But one of the problems that they would have with the sacrament or the sacrifice is that the woman still did this and she did not even know that that would be accepted. And usually when you were dealing with, with Yahweh, you had to do what he said. And you don't see none of them having to do that for the prophets. I don't even, really, when you look at it, it's like there's something in that woman that knew that there was something she needed. It didn't say that she was physically sick. It didn't say she was fat and out of shape and wasn't going to make no more money. It didn't say that she was crippled. It's as if she knew the, that she was damned. It's as if she, she reminds knew. me of the woman with the, the uh, two mites who gave all. I mean, she was bent and she, she, she knew her state. Not in the sense that the woman who gave the mites uh, was spent, but in the sense of giving her all, and you gave the example, you had the passage read where she said, uh, um, go and sell all that you have, and the guy walked away. You got people, well, I, I might be thinking of what you said, the public house, but anyway, uh, the, the, the state of her understanding who she was and that she was very dependent. Um, I think you used to sing that song. Did you say it uh, several times? Without him, I would be nothing. Without him, I should fail. Without him, I'd be drifting like a ship without a sail. So, um, to, to look at that and to see how she, how she came, I mean, she 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 could have stayed back and let everybody um, taunting her, ostracizing her, and even her own heart just keep keep her still. But he was there, and so. Um, that's what we have to remember in the world where everybody else saying different things about either who they, Jesus is not and who we are and stuff, but to see him, to see him. And so she didn't have to, she didn't have to care about what everybody else said. And so, um, the, the physician came to the sick. Thank you. Well, Mike, Mike, you stay with us the whole time. So were you, were you able to grab some, grasp some things out of that that you can use uh, when you're dealing with people? Because you do deal with a lot of people. And I know I appreciate you being with us as we were doing our roundtable tonight. Did you leave us, Gary? Yes, I sir. thought you said somebody named Michael. 
I, I never said the word Michael. That's your son. But um. <laughs> Okay, so uh, yeah, um, I was waiting on my <laughs> yeah, it was it was good and um, yeah, I mean it, it was um, it was it was uh, beneficial for me and um, Dre uh, enjoyed it as well. Thank you, thank you, Adrian. I, I see it on the on the screen. I I'm telling you now, we got hard issues. We got people that want to take our Bibles. We got people that want to shut down what they call the churches. We have people right now that want to make it illegal for you to know the difference between a man or a woman. And so not only did they already have some churches now that I believe have women that they think uh, that are men in their churches or men that they think that are women, but uh, it'll get to the place, get to the place now. You could actually date somebody and get married and this person could have breasts and have a thing that looked like a vagina and everything and you marry this person and somewhere find out down the line you've married a man and don't know it because from the time that they were a child you remember that time that that doctor had did that to some twins yeah. they cut that boy's penis out and made him like a girl yeah. all his life yeah. and he still had that problem so this is it, it reminds me of that, that movie Dr. Moreau that he had an island of Dr. Moreau. He would do things. We have people that's doing the same thing as like those science fiction movies. And uh, they've been doing it a long time. Bugs Bunny with dressing drags and drag. And now they have them come to your schools and teaching your children. Now the medical profession won't be able to deal with that. And I think in some states, law enforcement officer, they will not be able to call you male or female. And I think 13 states, 11 or 13 states have it now that when you get your license, you can put on that X. Mm. And when we move away the distinction in a culture, when you destroy the, the moral standards in a culture, you change the language of a culture, you've had your culture changed, and this country will not be the same. And that's why globalism was very, very important because those that are orchestrating and setting up the culture, they know what they're doing. They got a religion, and they want to they want to put people in their image and in their likeness, and make you a living sacrifice. The last thing I read today that I was reading where the sex trafficking in Baltimore is horrible. No, well, actually, Maryland, Maryland. Um, it, it didn't just mention Baltimore, but in Maryland, it's so bad that if you read about it. It will make you sick. It gave one illustration of a young girl that used to run away from home a lot and had friends to stay, and she eventually went somewhere else. And this guy was nice to her. He was nice looking. He was kind to her. And he would get her hair fixed, get her, I think, nail and feet done. And she ended up liking the older guy. And then when she ran away and got to be with him, then he got her to a hotel and said, Now you got to pay me back for this stuff that you've been, that you've been getting. And often it was saying that these girls, they get raped uh, well, anywhere from 15 to 20 times a day. And that one girl under the sex slave can make a pimp $200,000. Just one girl can earn them that much. They don't have to go and re-up like they do with drugs. They can use that same person over and over again. We have to not only warn our children, but we got to teach the word of God that these children need to learn to obey their, uh, honor their parents and their parents need to learn how to honor the most high God because some parents will actually pimp their children. That money can go for a parent as well as a stranger. We need the Lord. And the sad thing about it, if you were to see the article, it's a black man. That's done. That's doing this. We shouldn't be doing this to our own people. Well, I thank everybody for joining us for the round table. I look forward to just you know doing this on Sabbath Eve, just going into His Word, talking about His stuff, and the next time if if y'all willing, we'll go back to Exodus because there's no point in thinking about community, thinking about getting what we deserve or what America should do to us if we're not going to have a law and a system of righteousness. We can stay with what we have right now. We need him. 
in every way. May the Most High bless you and keep you. I see uh, Sister Delaney was with, us, was with us tonight, Adrian and uh, Pastor Garland, and I don't see a whole lot of people that had comments, but I appreciate everybody that joined us. Good night, everybody. Hello to Pastor Garland and good night to everybody. Yeah, because you know Pastor Garland, don't you? From a long time ago, I, I, so yeah, okay. that way. All right. Well, if the Lord's will, in about 11 hours, we'll be doing it again at uh, Bethel Church of the Nazarene. We'll be going through Psalm 127. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.